So as she said, I'm Susan Mueller. I received my master's at the University of Denver, and I now work here as a researcher. Um, when I started my graduate degree several years ago, I expressed an interest in biomedical technology, and the dean of the College of Engineering and Computer Science, Dean Ramash Rashi, had been approached by Dr. Stephen Albert from the Veterans Affairs Hospital here in Denver about a gap he saw in the market in the way we're treating diabetic foot ulcers. And I was very excited to come alongside of the two of them in solving the issue of how we can better treat diabetic foot ulcers. And I've been working on this active cast that I'm gonna talk about. So the current treatment method with the highest rate of healing is called the total contact cast. It's the gold standard, but it's used less than 2% of the time. This total contact cast is a fiberglass cast that's wrapped and applied to the leg to reduce the pressure on the bottom of the foot. And pressure reduction is the key element in healing diabetic foot ulcers. This fiberglass cast is a very lengthy process in the, in the application, and it takes a trained nurse, a trained a medical assistant to apply it. And it has to be applied every week. As the person atrophies or swells, the effectiveness of this total contact cast diminishes every day until a new total contact cast is applied. Additionally, the reimbursement rate to the physician is is a very negative factor. And that it, because of that, and because of all the other negative reasons, it, it's not a very attractive device. And that's why it's used less than 2% of the time. OK, so on the other end of the spectrum, the most commonly used treatment method is a modified shoe or a shoe insert. It's um, easy to use. It's comfortable to the patient. The doctors get reimbursed quite a bit for it. However, it has a very low rate of healing. In fact, it has the lowest rate of healing. Some studies say that it's an even an ineffective means of healing diabetic foot ulcers. So our objective in development of the active cast has been to model the successful components of the total contact cast with the benefits and convenience of the modified shoe. And we've done that by creating a hard shell and we have pneumatic bladders, and we have pumps and sensors, and we measure and we maintain pressure that's applied to the patient's leg without any input to maintain that pressure by the patient or the physician. So if the patient atrophies or swells, the cast adjusts. Um, so a, pa a doctor would apply this, set the pressure in the five bladders, and then the cast would take care of the rest. There are two key features that the active cast addresses that no other issue on the market addresses, and that's the development of new ulcers. New ulcers, we have a patent at the University of Denver that we can determine an ulcer developing before a doctor can even see it. And that technology allows us to alert the patient that an ulcer is forming, and then we can locally reduce the pressure where the ulcer is forming to prevent the ulcer from full development. And the second issue that's not being addressed on the market is that ulcers develop immediately after you get out of the cast because your skin has been softened. So the active cast is designed to re-toughen and re-thicken the skin on the bottom of your foot to reduce the likelihood of a new ulcer forming. So we believe that we've successfully modeled the total contact cast, which is the gold standard, but we've reduced the negative effects and made it more like the modified shoe so that we've married the two um, We've bridged that gap. And so, that being said, we're about to start human subject testing and to verify our belief that we've bridged that gap. And we, um, sorry, <laughs> we believe that the, this new treatment method will be on the market within three years. Thanks. Um, all right, Susan, any questions for Susan? Yeah, good question. How long do they keep it on? I mean, is it when they get up in the morning until they go to bed at night? Yes. That's, so how, that's how all the treatment, sorry, that's how all the medicine, she asked how long they keep it on. So um, all treatment methods, um, it's worn until the ulcer is healed. So this would be worn just like the others are healed, but it maintains pressure, so it's going to heal faster is what we believe. So how do you know when it's healed? They still go into the doctor, and it tells them when it's healed. But, um, <laughs> Maybe we should think about that. <laughs> but it's, it's preventative as well. Right. So, so if you think of kind of the, 
all the implications of diabetes from, from a medical perspective and some of the issues as far as amputation and that further develop, this is a way to proactively prevent some of that. All right, pretty interesting. 70,000 people go through amputation. 70,000. The reimbursement gap? <laughs> we are talking about that. That is something we've been talking quite a bit about. Um, that is not a simple issue. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> we will, once we apply for FDA approval and once we get a classification, that would set the stage for what kind of code, medical code we get. Um, that's a very good question because that's the key to a successful product in the medical world. At least here in the United States it is. <laughs> We could have a whole TEDx just on healthcare reform. Yeah, question over here. How do you detect the ulcers before you can see them, and how do you adjust the cast? Okay, that's a good question. Um, we do that through temperature sensing. Um, the patented technology that has come about at the University of Denver is if that a small, slight degree, two to th maybe, I don't know, two to three degrees of change locally compared to the other array of temperature sensors indicate that an ulcer is forming. Okay, how do I adjust the cast? So with an ulcer, like one of the common areas where an ulcer would be forming is on the shin. So we would have an array of temperatures. If one of those temperatures indicates that an ulcer is forming, then, then that region of the air bladder would decrease in pressure. And the rest of the air around the leg would still be sustaining. So what you're doing is you're reducing the pressure in the leg by suspending a portion of your leg by transferring the load from the bottom of your foot to the rest of the calf, but that region that's very small, you know, it might only be a couple of inches square. That region would, re pressure would be reduced. <laughs> One of the, yeah, this is the demo. <laughs> so you can just see the, um, it takes a few seconds because the program's calculating, but, um, and optimizing how fast the bladders um, air up, um, once they air up, the, they come back on as soon as they reduce pressure. But initially, it would take about 30 seconds for them to get, and if your leg is in here, they don't have to air up as far because obviously there's some resistance, but it's going to air all the way up, so it's going to take a little bit longer because there's no leg in here. And then they shut off until there's a, a pressure. If you swell, there would be additional pressure on the bladders, and then they would be, they would exhaust. Schultz, and obviously you're very passionate about the subject. What inspired you to pursue this? What inspired me? Um, I got my undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering, and I really thought that I wanted to broaden that degree and to get a little bit more breadth, and so I saw my master's here at Denver University in mechatronics, but I knew that <laughs> it's a mechanical electrical, it's kind of a fancy word that just means a hybrid of electrical engineering and mechanical, but um, I just knew that there was just a really growing problem with the age gap. I mean, what is it, the baby boomer generation? With all of them aging and diabetes alone, I mean, is supposed to double by 2034. I really wanted to do a, a focus in a medical device. And honestly, this idea wasn't my idea. This was, like I said, this gap came from the physician, but I was just excited to be a part of it. The total cost of the cast. Well, the goal is to be less. <laughs> but um, the par the problem and the reason why the physician okay, there's two things. There's physician reimbursement rate and there's cost, and those aren't the same. Physician reimbursement rate comes by insurance code. It, I don't mean to be insulting, but I didn't know that. Um, but there's codes. There's medical codes, and when you can get a medical code, some medical codes have a better reimbursement rate. So, however much it costs minus the reimbursement rate is what the doctor makes. So. But part of the problem with the total contact cast is it's, it's, not a, it's not a device code, it's an application code. And so you can't bill for application and devices, but instead of going into all that, it takes 45 minutes to apply, so the time on the total contact cast is the expensive part. Because it takes 45 minutes in the doctor's office, and they only get to bill for the application. 
so that I don't know if that makes sense. It's actually quite a complicated answer, but it takes such a long time. Our reduction in cost is going to be by reducing the time it, it takes in the physician's office by being able to apply this and set it within 10 minutes. And that's bringing the patient in, debriving the wound, putting on the wound. The cast itself, two minutes. You know, so that's where we really believe we're going to save the cost. 